there are at least four mineral deficiencies that can significantly affect your IQ. That's the topic for today. Generally speaking, it's your intelligence, it's your ability to solve problems, it's your ability to learn and understand certain things. There's a memory or a recall component to it. And some people say, well, you know what? Your intelligence is really finite and either you're born with it or you're not. That's absolutely not true, okay? You can have training, you can do self-improvement, you can do a lot of things. And even what your mother ate while she was pregnant has a, a factor on your intelligence and your future ability to solve problems as you're gonna find out. But there are other factors too, like with learning, it could be that you were in school and no one ever taught you how to study or learn. And I'm being very sarcastic because they don't teach kids how to study or learn. You're just expected to know that. So you go in there and you sort of memorize, you reread, you rewrite things over and over, and hopefully somehow you pass the test and you get through it. But today I want to really focus in on the nutrient part of your intelligence. So probably one of the most influential trace minerals, which you don't need a lot of it, but you need a little bit of it. And if you don't have that little bit, you're going to be in big trouble because if you're deficient in iodine as a child, your IQ can go down significantly like 13 points. Okay. Now, even if you're deficient in iodine as an adult, there are certain studies that show that it can decrease by 15 points. And that's pretty significant. But the crucial time to get iodine is when the woman is pregnant with that baby, as well as when they're breastfeeding. Vitally important. And so iodine is involved in the creation of your brain and of certain parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, which is involved with learning, memory, being able to navigate yourself through different things. So primarily we have the hippocampus and then the frontal lobe involved in problem solving. But of course, how much of these parts of the brain are involved with problem solving in IQ? I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Some people have had huge amounts of trauma and damage to their brains. I mean, destruction of a good portion of the brain, and they still seem to maintain their cognitive function and their IQ. So I just wanted to point that out because we really don't know how much brain we really need. Apparently we have a lot of extra. Now, the second mineral that is the most important is zinc. Zinc is involved in hundreds of different enzyme reactions. Okay, it's definitely involved with the hippocampus. It's involved with making neurotransmitters. And if you're low on zinc, your IQ is going down. But this zinc correlates with copper. They both work together. So you need this zinc to copper ratio. And when you have children that have autism, for example, there's nearly always extremely low zinc and copper levels. But there's a huge correlation between high IQ and good zinc to copper ratios. Copper is also very low in Alzheimer's patients. Also, it's super concentrated in a structure in your brainstem called the locus ceruleus, which has everything to do with your sleeping. And then we have magnesium. Magnesium is needed for making ATP. It's needed for energy in the brain. And if you don't have enough magnesium, there is a huge correlation between a lower IQ. And so if we look at this right here, we have you know, seafood, shellfish, okay? And magnesium, salad, vegetables, leafy greens, but you can also get it in nuts and other foods as well. But seafood, shellfish, very important to get the top three. I wanted to add a few more. Vitamin D deficiency is also correlated with learning dis disabilities, lower IQ, and cognitive function. So here's another one that's very, very important, especially if you are pregnant. Now, iron also correlates with a lower IQ, probably because it's involved with anemia and red blood cells and carrying oxygen to your brain. Now, there's a couple other things I really need to cover related to this cognitive function. And that has to do with this thing called sugar. Sugar actually makes you stupid. It definitely correlates with a lower IQ. Now, that being said, I do want to make a very important point. Just because someone has a high IQ, just because someone is so-called intelligent doesn't mean that they are sane, okay? They could be very intelligent, 
but be in completely insane. And when I talk about insane, I'm talking about destructive, right? But when we're talking about sugar, we're talking about blood sugar, we're talking about even diabetes. So if your A1C is like above seven, your recall is goes down, okay? Your ability to recall memories is significantly affected. Diabetics on average have a lower IQ by 7.84 points. When someone is a diabetic and they have higher sugar in their blood, that shrinks the hippocampus. So we have less hippocampus to work with, which means less capacity for memory, less capacity for learning, and that is intimately connected with IQ. Now, if we take a look at the brain uh, that has insulin resistance, okay, it's brain insulin resistance, which is always the case for someone that has high sugar, like a diabetic, there is a lot of destruction going on in the neurons, okay? And so when you feed the brain cells, the neurons, too much sugar, you end up destroying those synapses. And thank goodness there's an alternative fuel to bypass that whole thing and get the energy that the neurons need so you can have more intelligence. And that alternative fuel is ketones. Now, what's interesting about ketones is that your brain is the organ that does not have to adapt to ketones like other parts of the body. In other words, there's not a period of three days where you have to adapt or convert over to ketones. It can use ketones immediately if it's in the blood. There's not a lot of, if any, stored sugar in the brain. The brain does not store glycogen. Why? Because there's no space. Because when you're storing glycogen, you have to store a lot of water and there's just no space. So. The brain is dependent for its energy from the blood, okay? And then that usually comes from your liver primarily. So if your liver's damaged, that can affect the brain. But if the brain has a choice between ketones or glucose, it will always pick ketones as a primary fuel. And that way, even if there's damage to the brain, the brain cells can get energy. So in other words, your brain is very vulnerable to what diet you are on. And really what determines if there's ketones in your blood or not is really two things, glucose and your insulin levels. So when a person starts to go on the ketogenic diet and they start lowering their glucose, uh, they notice also their insulin levels lower, they may still have problems and they may not notice the significant benefits of ketosis for quite some time, primarily because there's this uh, background uh, basic level of insulin in their blood at all times. And if someone is obese, they usually have like three times the insulin levels. And this really has nothing to do with their diet. It's just that their baseline insulin is just a lot higher than someone that doesn't have a weight problem. So if you are watching and you're overweight, just realize the more you lose weight, the more the insulin levels decrease, the more the benefits, and it could take some time. So what are the takeaways from this video? shellfish, seafood, big salads, and cut the sugar out and go on a low carb diet. Now there's a lot more to talk about the brain. If you haven't seen this video related to brain health, this would be a very interesting one to watch next.